people. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, everyone, all the organizers. It's a really pleasure and honor to be here. As Patricia mentioned, yeah, we met in March in Tours. Uh, she didn't say that it was a wine festival, <laughs> uh, but it was a Saturday, it was a weekend. And uh, I was with my former PhD supervisor and my great, great friend and collaborator, Dr. Pascal Mermillot from France, who I, I'll show many pictures now in my presentation. And uh, I told him, yeah, I heard some Portuguese, I'm pretty sure. And then, uh, I, and then we were like, uh, well, really a coincidence because she, her husband and I we were all veterinarians. And I mean, she's also a professor in Rio de Janeiro, like I am, <laughs> but I mean, Ufi, she's in the rural university. And I mean, it was such a coincidence. And, and then she came up with this idea, like to talk about my experience. And initially they said, no, please. I don't have like this, like, so, um, I don't know, long-term, you know, partnership, but oh no yes please because i mean like i'll present i had the experience of going as a student and now as a as a professor so she said no it will be really interesting to have your you know your experience okay so well i hope i don't disappoint you <laughs> um let me share here my talk okay is it um is it good for you yeah yes okay great you just need to make it uh yes th there it goes it's just like a little bit of delay let me just uh, hide this here no uh papa. okay whatever so, yeah, so thank you very much, all of you again. And um, I'll present a little bit of my research background. So I graduated in Rio de Janeiro, where I'm originally from. So I was born here. I am Carioca, okay, I was born in Rio. And I did my veterinary studies here. And that's when I started working on reproductive biotechnologies. And also, uh, I always had like a great interest in the small ruminant models, okay? And after I graduated, of course, Rio de Janeiro is a big city and does not have many small ruminants around. So I had to move to leave Rio. And then I went um, to do a specialization in Sao Paulo countryside. I'm sorry, is it this appearing for you? I don't want to, yeah. Okay, um, I use a lot of Google Meet, but not so much um, Zoom. Patricia, here, is it okay here? I think it's better, right? Yeah. Okay, um, so, so yeah, so I graduated in veterinary here in, in Rio de Janeiro, and then I went to Sao Paulo countryside, and then to do my master's in Viçosa Federal University in Minas Gerais State. Okay, this beautiful university here. Uh, and then I went from a PhD to work in CRI State University, which is 3,000 kilometers from Rio. And back uh, in 2014, I, I came back to Rio de Janeiro again as, um, as initially as a postdoc, as Patricia mentioned. And in 2017, I got a permanent position as a professor here in this university. So I work usually in Niterói, in the city of Niterói, which is very close to Rio de Janeiro city. Just get this beautiful bridge and then we are in Niterói. And sometimes at the school farm, so in those pictures here below, um, this school farm, it's uh, ar around 70 kilometers from, from Niterói. Okay, and the university is very big, it's very nice, and you're all invited to visit us here. But maybe if I didn't convince you with those pictures, I can convince you with those ones from Rio de Janeiro. And I must say that Niterói is not bad either. So it's, it's a very nice city, and I'm sure you like when you come for a visit. Well, um, 
so since my undergraduate studies, uh, I always enjoyed and I always had in mind working on reproductive biotechnologies. So initially I started in those more involving more applied uh, research such as astrocycle control, use of ultrasonography, artificial insemination. And then I kind of migrated to uh, more basic stuff like uh, related to in vitro and in vivo embryo production, gametes and embryo cryopreservation. And we also worked in some transgenic animals and did some cloning um, runs. So almost all reproductive biotechnologies uh, since my, my master's and until now. And uh, a bit different from an interesting, it was really interesting to hear Rodrigo because it's a different area. So um, what I think it's like a more, uh, let's say that I'm lucky is that Usually these research interests, so this uh, area like focused on embryo production and cryopreservation, it also is of big interest abroad, so as also in France. Okay, so this is something great for us. Okay, so Patricia asked me to start uh, from the very beginning. And uh, so I'd like to tell you this story. Back to 2009, I was a master's student when I met Dr. Pascal Mermillot, he came for a lecture in Sao Paulo and I was there. So I heard his talk and I was like fascinated by that subject and by the results he had, you know, like those very um, shining sperm and embryos, like using like very new techniques that I didn't have contact here in Brazil at that time. So I was like impressed and then I contacted him and I was like uh, curious to know if I still had the email and I did. I found the first email I sent to him like over 14 years ago and um, I was like very lucky because no one introduced us. It was like a master's student sending an email to a very important researcher, you know, without anyone in common to recommend me. But Pascal is a very, very kind and humble person. So he replied my email a few hours later, like really um nice and like open for ideas and collaborations so i first asked him if i could he couldn't receive me for the whole phd and uh it was it was uh well as he mentioned at that time it would be easier for me to enter in a phd program here in brazil and then go for a short time a short visit what we call sandwich phd and uh, probably he was right. I mean, it's sometimes it's it's better, I believe, like for the government to pay for four students to go for one year than to pay for one person. Right? So that's what I did. I decided to change the my my university to change the research group, and um, to try to find a place, a lab, where the um. The supervisor, you know, would work in research lines more similar to those that Pascal did in France. So more uh, going to embryo production, as I was mentioning. And uh, so I also saw a talk from Dr. Vicente Freitas from, in the end, my PhD supervisor. And uh, we were in a conference and I, wow, really interesting and, you know, something similar to what Pascal is doing. And uh, so I, I I talked to him about the possibility of doing my PhD with him. And if he, if he would allow me to go to France, you know, because that was a priority for me. I really wanted to go. Um, as I mentioned to you, I, I always wanted to work in small ruminants. And I mean, I think all of us know uh, how the dairy goat production in France is, is strong, you know, all the dairy I mean, cheese market and all of that. So, and also the research like follow these, you know, commercial um, aspects. So they were doing like really good things in France. And uh, so I talked to Professor Vicente and uh, he was pleased like to allow me to go if he would find a uh, funding, of course. And uh, Coincidentally, he also did his PhD in France at INHAE and the same center at the same Val de Loire in Uzi, 
So that was like really a perfect plan and it worked like quite well. So year after I was there and in my first year, uh, we had public uh, national call from Capes Coffee Cube. So a bilateral project with Brazilian funding and also like French funding. And uh, we then applied, we did our best and uh, lucky, like we were, we were approved. We had our proposal approved. So uh, the year after I embarked like to France in what in the end was a co-total PhD, like a co-tutorship PhD. So I was able to stay 18 months in France at that time. And um, this co-total is, is a possibility um, in these Capes Coffee Cube grants. It's not that simple. You know, uh, now we had an, a question very interesting, like for Rodrigo, asking if it was easier now or if it's harder. And uh, I don't know, but I I think that nowadays, and I don't think it's just Brazil or France. I think it's everywhere. The bureaucracy now is getting crazy. So before, when a student went, it was like so much easier, like uh, the paperwork to prepare, you know, and documentation and all of that. And nowadays. Each year we are sending students and it's becoming more and more bureaucracy. But uh, at that time, I don't know if it changed, but Cototel has some particularities. Uh, I'll present some of them to you soon. Um, so yeah, so well, I went and we started our first publications together. And uh, it, was, it was really, really good, really great and interesting. The other day, um, I was sharing a talk from a colleague from the south of Brazil, and uh, he was showing some data that when you have like more than two countries in the authorship list, uh, this paper is more cited. You know, so this is something interesting, and uh, yeah, so we have these first papers together, and uh, those are well cited. And, um, well, uh, okay, so this was like a, around 10 years ago. We are still in collaboration. We are still sending students. And nowadays we have around, I would say like 18 to 20 papers together with this group. You know, so it's like, a, it's becoming a, a beautiful um, history together, let's say. And also book chapters. And, so it was like a fantastic experience for a student, as you probably can imagine, and I'll speak a little bit about that later, more. Okay, it was, well, one and a half year, it's quite a long time. And uh, uh, it was really hard to come back, like in several aspects <laughs> after one and a half year, it was really hard. But okay, so Tu is a very beautiful city, as you probably know or heard about it. And uh, all of that, uh, you know, it's like it really changes uh, a student life, let's say, both like professionally and personally. Um, uh, so, well, so 2000, uh, in the end of 2012, I came back to Brazil and Six months later, I was defending my, my PhD. And since we had this convention of Cototel signed, I had to follow some procedures. Okay, and I don't know if it changed in the last years. Apparently, it depends on both institutions who are signing the Cototel. There's a flexibility. But uh, at that time, uh, we followed the model of the university uh, in Tours uh, and in Ha, in Haia, sorry. Um, and uh, we had to have two jury members from France in the PhD defense. Since we had this Capes Coffee Cube approved, uh, we organized for them to be here with this grant. Otherwise, it would be difficult to bring two jury members from France. And also the whole PhD defense had to be held in English or French. Okay. I mean, it's not the end of the world. It's something that it can be done, but it's a little bit, um, a little bit, let's say, special, a little bit more complicated than a normal sandwich PhD. 
And so, okay, so in 2017, as I presented to you, I was already as a professor here in Rio de Janeiro. And my former PhD supervisor, Dr. Freitas, invited me to participate in the new call, the new Capes Coffee Cube project. Now, not as a student, but as a team member. So we wrote together the call, the, the proposal, and uh, we approved it again. And so after that, I was able to send until now like four PhD students. Those were are just those guys that were in my lab that I was the advisor, but there were also other students that went, okay, from different colleagues, from different team members. So the four of them went to France, to Inhaï, to the same lab. And um, I'm pretty sure that it also changed their lives, this trip. I think Elange is here online also. Okay, and uh, th so the year after, so 2018, uh, there was a different call, national call in Brazil named Capes Print. Print, exactly this I here is for interna internationalization, okay? So there is a different program of internationalization, a bit different from what Capes Coffee Cube is because Capes Coffee Cube is a, is a professor that makes his own team, you know, and write the proposal and submit as the coordinator. Um, but Capes Print was like the whole university together. And uh, it involves like several different uh, graduate courses and also like countries for collaboration as well. So since we already had this collaboration with friends, I was invited to participate like from the veterinary medicine graduate course. And uh, since this program, the coordination is different, uh, the university makes like an intern call. So several um, different graduate courses submitted their proposal. And then the prorector of research or his team, let's say, uh, chooses the best options that will like go well together. And then they submit, the prorector of research submits the whole project together. So here's the project with over 120 pages. And this call, it also like provided like uh, students trips, so sandwich PhD and work missions and visits for researchers to go and to come back. And uh, we were also like, successful in the submission. So we currently have like two projects funded by CAPES uh, with our French collaborators, the CAPES Coffee Cube and CAPES Print. And um, so last year, our second CAPES Coffee Cube uh, finished and there was again a new call. CAPES Coffee Cube is going, um, is working, let's say it's it's alive for over 40 years, I believe. So it's a really old um, public call available in I think all, every two years, something like that. So last year they had another call, our project was finishing and they had like a statement that the same coordinator could not submit it again. It had to be like an interstice for over one year. So we decided like not, not to wait and to submit again the new proposal, changing the coordinators. So we we submitted like uh, Dr. Mahi Sandizier from, from Inhaé as a co the current coordinator and me from Brazil. And um, luckily like we were, we were selected again. So that's our third Capes Coffee Cube together with the same team. This Capes Coffee Cube, it lasts from two years, but renewable for two more years. So it usually lasts for 40 years. I never heard a case that could not be renewed. So if you do everything correctly, I think there is not a problem. So it lasts for 40 years. And each year, what are the benefits, let's say? Uh, Capes pays uh, around 2,000 euros, even a bit less than that, for buying consumables for the lab. I mean, this is almost nothing for those that work in the lab and, and in the field that we work. This is almost nothing, but uh, I don't want to complain. I'm just saying what they offer and what is their really interest is to provide like a, 
um, people going and coming back. So students going, researchers coming, researchers going. That's the main intent of this call. Okay, and that's great. So we have put here two work missions from Brazilians, for Brazilians to go from Brazil to France that lasts from 10 to 15 days and two work missions for French colleagues to come to Brazil from seven to 10 days. I don't know why this time is different, but that's how it is in the call. And two student missions per year, okay? And these students, they uh, involve like, well, postdocs are not students, but that's how they call in the call, how they name it in the call. So PhD and postdocs, okay? And, um, okay, let me see. Yeah, that's it. So here, for example, when a Brazilian go from Brazil to France, uh, CAPES pays for the flight tickets and France for the per diem, for the daily expenses, and the opposite's the same. You know, uh, there are some difficulties here. So for example, we had we have like a fixed price, fixed value to buy the ticket. And we all know that in the pandemic, the flight tickets like increased substantially. So many times the ticket costs more than the maximum paid by Capis and also by Coffee Cube, as uh, they, they tell me. Okay. And uh, it's, for example, this is something like really small, but just to mention. So for example, we go for 15 days in the winter. Now in December, I'm probably going again. And uh, with this, this mission, and uh, I mean, it's winter in France, it's 15 days, but we cannot pay for any luggage. We have to pay from our pocket, let's say 100 euros or 120 euros. And it's winter, of course. I mean, this is something that I think it should be revised, like, because it's something like so small, but it, at the same time, it's not like, you know, fair, like for us to pay from our pocket. But it's something small from all the benefits we have in these calls. So in this year, uh, in 1st of November, I'm sending like three fellows like to France again. So the lab <laughs> will be a bit more empty from 1st of November. So two PhD students are going, one from Capes Coffee Cube, Paulo Vitor, who is here today also, um, from the scholarship from Capes Print. And Anna, who is a postdoc, she's also going uh, with Capes Coffee Cube. And interesting to say that um, Anna was not going this year. It was another student from another professor, from a team member. Uh, but at this year, for the first time, it is required to have a TOEFL um, approval. Okay. So all the students that went before, they did not have to do it, the TOEFL exam. And this guy that was going, from a different colleague lab. Uh, he didn't have the TOEFL test. He did one and it's a, it's an expensive test. Well, can be it's expensive depending on each one, of course. And it was expensive for him. Uh, and uh, he could not, he was not approved like in the, in the first time he did it. And also mixed probably with some other personal reasons. I don't know, but he gave up going, you know. But what is interesting is that some national calls like um, that that allow like sending a PhD students, some of them require the TOEFL, like now Capes Coffee Cube is requiring, but some of them don't. And it's the same grant, like for the same student from the same university to go to the same institute. <laughs> and uh, the rules sometimes change. You know? So now TOEFL is needed. Uh, and we are very, very lucky that our university gave free courses for all the graduate students preparing them for TOEFL and also pays for the exams. But I know this is like not everywhere like for sure. So my students already had the TOEFL exam. So I was able to indicate them like quite um, fast because of that. But this can be like a, a bottleneck sometimes. Okay, so Patricia also asked me to put some of the challenges of participating in this kind of program. And uh, so I, I believe like the first one is that almost all my students, they never left the country, you know? So suddenly, because it's it's expensive, like to leave the country, to travel abroad uh, for most of them, especially when you're still a student. So it's expensive. So they suddenly, they go like to live in a different, totally different country, 10,000 kilometers away. So this can be challenging, 
And uh, I must say that they never like struggled with that. They never had like a big problem with that. But we know that it's it's a challenge. And also they miss their family. It's a different culture or society, as Rodrigo said, and I like that. And it's a big difference in the way of relating. So, I mean, we are all Latins, but, um, but it's still very different, you know. Uh, and the language, of course, because it's totally different when you give a talk in one hour or when you have to speak a different language like the whole day for months. And uh, uh, so these are some challenges, but these are like uh, quite small compared to all the benefits they they receive. And this is like on animals. All of them say that. And also another challenge <laughs> Uh, impossible not to mention this can be a problem for some people it's not for me I love the winter and the French winter and snow I don't care but it can be a problem because the temperature it's very very different but it's again like something small compared to all the benefits uh, so about the bureaucracy and uh, these the uh, these details let's say Sometimes uh, what happened, for example, to my last student that went to Erlandia, uh, we sent all the documentations at the right time. Okay, so 90 days before the, the travel, the trip. And uh, we proceeded like uh, smoothly, everything okay. But Cap is just paid for her tickets. I asked her to check in her bank account 20 days before the trip. So the flights were like uh, almost twice the price and she had to afford that. You know, so and and we were like keeping sending emails like, please, when are you gonna pay? The flights are getting higher prices, and so this can be a problem. Now, a quite big problem that we are facing uh, is that INHAE requires like a minimum of um fifteen ninety four euros per month, so thousand five hundred, almost six hundred euros per month, and. Uh, I understand. I think it's great, you know, and uh, this is like what is required. But Capis just pays uh thousand three hundred. Okay, so the last student that went, the French Institute had to pay her the extra two hundred something euros per month, and of course, uh, they they told me that they cannot afford that for every student that is going, and I totally understand that. I couldn't also if it would be with me. Uh, so we are working on that, you know, so what I was doing uh, was um, summing up like the installation um, aid, <laughs> yeah, money, uh, which is like just one time. And then I was like sharing by six months, you know, and the um, medical insurance, they give like 90 euros per month. And then in the end, we have the 1600 euros per month. That's what INHAE requires. So I did a document explaining that, that they will receive that. It's just with different names. And they accepted that. And good. That's what we put like in the in the um, partnership we signed, this amount. But what is the problem is that this amount, it's more than the student uh, visa allows here in Brazil. So now they have like an interview with the consulate trying to reach someone to see how we can solve this problem. Because... Well, I think it was understood. I can explain better later. But uh, we are like struggling with that. I even wrote to the um, coordinator of the international relationship of CAP is explaining the situation. And he was very nice and kind and helpful. But I mean, there is nothing really he can do. <laughs> so we're trying. We're trying to see because we have like three guys, three fellows going and uh, still like in this process of requiring visa and what they can do with visa and all of that. Okay, so uh, now it's, I, I think it's becoming a little bit better, like uh, regarding the flexibility. So before, for example, we had for the work missions, for example, 950 euros per ticket. So we had to find a ticket less than 550 euros. And now it's very hard to find this. Okay, so, but now there's a flexibility, for example, I'm going on in December. I had to do like a raise schedule of the money and reduce something here. And so to increase the flight ticket. So, I, I mean, I think that the uh, the people organizing this calls, they are saying that it's some things need to be done and to be more flexible, you know, 
and uh, I think it's it's working, it's improving. Uh, Rodrigo also mentioned that about the difficult, I, I brought some like uh, successful cases of approving these projects, but it's not easy. I also had like projects that I submitted and it was denied. Okay. And uh, just for an, an example, this one we got now this year, uh, there were like only 33 projects in the whole Brazil. Okay. For all the areas of knowledge. So, I mean, I went to read the talks that the titles and, um, uh, they, I, I'm pretty sure it was the only project in the agronomical, um, agricultural, sorry, veterinarian area. I'm pretty sure it was the only one approved. There maybe had one more just by the titles. And of course, uh, we all know that, uh, uh, probably this is everywhere. So depending on who is in the government, you know, we have more calls, more investments in science or less. I think this is probably worldwide. So sometimes we have like almost zero call available. Sometimes we have more. Uh, and this, this, I put this slide like, oops, sorry. Now in the morning, because I remember that and I thought it could be interesting to show. So around one month ago, uh, another colleague from Inhaia um, sent me an email. If I could participate in an appeal, in a call uh, from Coffee Cube, no, sorry, from France, from the French government, um, National Agents of Research in France. Uh, and I was like, yeah, sure, because uh, they can have like some Brazilians participating. Oh, great. Yeah, you can count on me. And then when we went to check, it's just specifically for those researchers working in Pernambuco, which is in the northeast of Brazil and Sao Paulo. So since I work in Rio, not possible. So I suggested her some names. I gave some contacts. So sometimes there are some calls, but they are very focused in, in small groups. So, well, and advantages, I don't think I need to, to say that, but I'll do it shortly. Uh, there are like several, several advantages in participating in this kind of program. You know, something that as a student and now as a professor that I can see, you know, is that the, the structure available in France, well, of course I cannot speak about the whole France, but the the only experience I had at Inhaye, but I mean, availability of equipment and laboratory products, you know, um, I was ordering, for example, a primer for molecular biology in France, and the time limit was like 48 hours to arrive. And here in Brazil, it's over one month. And this is like something very small, but this happens like uh, many, many times. And so it's it's really, it's really like fruitful. It's really good like to, to work there because of all these equipment and people and uh, availability of resources in general, let's say. Uh, and then of course, this en ends up with uh, high scientific production and for both countries, because uh, we also have like a, a big team. So sometimes depending on the project we, we organize, uh, we propose, we have, uh, we need to have like more than 10 people involved, you know, and this is quite hard to do in France as at least in the group I work with, as they mentioned. So this is something that we can do. So we have like some strengths and some, you know, weakness that it's very good when we uh, join. Uh, and of course, we already mentioned that and the previous talk, the professional and personal growth and discover new culture and society and it's this is like uh unbelievably good and great for the students so i just now brought some pictures and i'm almost finishing uh from from the work missions we had uh with the french colleagues here in brazil okay so this is their last visit so they came in july of last year and uh we had an experiment in the farm you know, and you can see here like 25 people involved in the experiment and they were like uh, really interested in see how it was working and it was great. Uh, and coincidentally, at the same time, the call, the call that we, the third call we got now, it was open at that time. So we were in the lab. This is a, no, not lab, an office. This is an office inside the farm 
okay? And we were the three of us working in the call together, okay? The Capis Coffee Cube call. Uh, and we always, I always organize workshops when they come, okay? So we, we reach the uh, Prorector of Extension, they organize the certificates, and we invite some colleagues and, and friends, and sorry, and students, like from other universities here in Rio de Janeiro State, and also Minas Gerais State, uh, from where Rodrigo is from. Uh, yeah, so we organize these workshops. Uh, I always ask my students to make presentations of their projects, so they already used to do that. They all have to speak in, in English. Uh, and to present their projects like in five minutes or 10 minutes or something like that, okay? So they all pay attention and interact. And of course, they have different levels of English fluency, but uh, we always say that this is not a problem. You know, it doesn't matter. They just need to communicate and they are, yeah. And usually they hold it very well. Uh, and last time Pascal came, it was with Capis Print Grant, so it was a visiting professor, so he was here for 20 days in Rio. So we also organized a practical course um, for the graduate, uh, um, our graduate course in the veterinary medicine, so for master's and PhD students. Uh, so he was like a... And, uh, so we did like 100% practical and just some like talks, like very informal, you know, and the students loved it. He was like 40 hours with them in the lab and they just love it. Yeah. Uh, and it's also very good for the course and evaluation from CAPES. Uh, and also, again, like we mentioned about culture and stuff for them, the same, you know, so the Rio de Janeiro is like flora and fauna, you know, and uh it's it's also great for them to visit here usually like they usually enjoy a lot and the cultural life in general so sometimes the students uh, um take them like to to go out and try to teach some dances and Uh, and they, they they like it in general. So this was my last visit. Uh, in general, no, I believe always. <laughs> and this was my last visit now in March. Uh, and I don't have any picture from my talk, but I swear <laughs> I gave a talk and I was in the lab and we discussed projects, but I don't have, I just have pictures um, of having fun. Okay, so those are the ones I brought. And uh, also the time when I met Patricia and when we explained uh, the, the history. So I'd like to acknowledge, you know, these are the guys that I work with every day in the reproduction sector at the university and the Listudium for organizing this. Uh, of course, my great, great friends and collaborators and my student group. And this is our Instagram and my email and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much.